Hi, folks. Very happy to be here. And I thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope you enjoy it and learn something from it. So um, allow me to briefly introduce myself. My name is Kaivan, Kaivan Bilamoria. And uh, I've been in the industry a while. And you know, um, this is stuff about me. Uh, I won't blab about it. I'll leave it to you to take a look. Um, more relevant to you know our stuff. This is my GitHub page. I I'm sure I have it open here. Yeah, this is my GitHub page, and I have several repositories. A few of which actually managed to grab a star or two. And um, yes, please do take a look uh, back over here. Actually, I um, am proud regarding this um, aspect. From 2018, uh, Pack Publishing contacted me and um, I have been lucky enough to have been contracted to write some books on Linux. And, you know, I've been doing that besides my regular work. And as of now, I have written these four books. Uh, please do pick them up, have a look, and let me know if you like them, point out mistakes. All of them have um, open source GitHub repos and um, make a pull request. And, um, you know, we we take things forward that way. This is my author page on Amazon. Anyway, enough enough about me. Uh, what what are we here for? So, uh, folks, of course, the title of this presentation you know, uh, leveraging the Linux CPU scheduler, and it's um, to show you about stuff like the ability to write real time apps um, on Linux and um, more on that, you know, scheduling and stuff like that. So let me get into it. Um, I hope what I have done here isn't on the screen. Okay, cool. So um, before getting into the agenda and the actual material, uh, you'll find all of the material over here on this GitHub site of mine, the PDF slides and the source code. So, you know, please go ahead and clone it and um, run the code, read the presentation and enjoy. So in, in terms of what we're covering, um, we want to get into the meaning of real time and several other things. So let's get started, guys. Um, what, what exactly do we mean by real time? I, I think we all intuitively know it's the situation where it's not just about getting the result right, but also getting it on time. In other words, there are time constraints, deadlines, and we have to meet them. So, you know, this is unlike perhaps most of the apps uh, that most of us are used to writing the apps that run on um, typical systems, they're often non-real time. Real time apps exhibit some characteristics. One of the key characteristics is called determinism. We need something known as a deterministic response. In other words, um, no matter the amount of load on the system, we still need to respond within the given deadline and get the job done within that. Um, of course, the real world being what it is, we cannot absolutely guarantee this deterministic response, even in real time apps, to a small degree. It's always possible that there will be a variance in meeting the time constraint. At times, you in fact might do better, at times a little worse. 
So, you know, this variance, it's uh, the term for it, the term used to describe it is called jitter. And um, we're looking to keep the jitter down as low as possible in a real-time system and in our real-time apps. And, you know, the good thing is stuff like this can be measured. So uh, I'll, I'll show you some benchmarks later when we come to Linux uh, doing this kind of stuff. Now, another key point, which um, actually is mis, uh, misread pretty often, is um, we tend to think that real time means real fast. Not necessarily. It does sometimes, but not all the time. So um, what I'm trying to get at is, for example, with something like a nuclear power station, you are having a controlled reaction. And what if it goes wrong? Now, that could become a disaster, as, as we're all aware. So uh, scientists have a means to stop the reaction. You know, the insertion of cadmium rods or whatever. I, I forget these details that I learned back in high school. But the point being, there will be a given amount of time and it's fairly generous. It's probably in seconds or perhaps even minutes. I don't really know. But it's not like, you know, milliseconds or microseconds. But it still very much is real time. If we don't get it done in that deadline, it's a unmitigated disaster, as we all know. So guys, um, moving along, um, in order to run real-time apps, we require and demand what's known as an RTOS, a real-time operating system. So I know the question is, is Linux one? I'm, I'm getting to that very shortly. But for now, let's just talk about real-time. Um, another key characteristic of real time is that it's algorithms, most of its algorithms, they tend to be what are known as big O one algorithms. You, you have heard of the time complexity. So big O one is deterministic, even under worst case load, it will, or rather under load, it will still perform in a certain given worst case time. Those are super algorithms. And as a matter of fact, even the vanilla Linux kernel uses many such algorithms in its normal day-to-day -day work, which is fantastic. Um, but real time needs big O one pretty much everywhere. So uh, we could broadly, very broadly classify operating systems like this. At one extreme is the so-called GPOS, at the other extreme, the RTOS. GPOS, of course, is an abbreviation for general purpose operating system. Um, Non-real-time operating systems. So guys, uh, Linux is in fact a GPOS. So is Windows, Unix, Mac OS. These operating systems have not been designed to support real-time. It's never been the intention, so they don't. On the other hand, an RTOS is explicitly designed to support real time, obviously. And um, that is what you use it for. So guys, um, in terms of real time, here's the interesting bit. On the scale of real time response, the GPOS is completely non-real time. And on the other extreme with the RTOS, we have something called hard real time. Hard real time is the, you know, exciting domains, the cases where you must meet the deadline every time, absolutely essential. You can't miss the deadline. It could result in financial loss, loss to human life, both of them, and all kinds of bad stuff. So when we have such requirements, you need an RTOS. There's no other way. Um, the interesting thing is, 
there is something in between that uh, some folks refer to as firm real time and further to the left being less real time than firm is something referred to as soft real time so guys uh, soft real time is interesting to us why because the vanilla generic mainline linux operating system easily qualifies as a soft real time os but what does that mean so let's uh, come to these step by step um so here we are and i i think this is pretty obvious a gpos is non real time there is little to no determinism jitter can vary to any extent and frankly we don't care too much because we aren't writing those kinds of apps so you know your typical business app enterprise kind of database stuff in general we are not writing it to be real time at least i am assuming this your typical web apps um nobody's really measuring the time or you know yesterday it ran one second faster or slower we we frankly don't even care to measure as long as it works we're happy those are the non real time ones which gpos is run perfectly well and then we have a gpos with soft real time and and this is an interesting case because linux easily qualifies so you know soft real time is all about best effort um the code the algorithms they will strive to their best extent to meet all deadlines all the time but they don't guarantee it um you might meet deadlines pretty much all the time but miss some of them and that's okay that's that's exactly what soft real time means you are not meant to use this stuff to control an aircraft or a submarine and so on um there is some jitter there is determinism but there also isn't and deadlines don't always get met but that doesn't have a major impact it's it's more of an annoyance so folks um consumer electronics is a great example so on on your smartphone you're watching a uh, streaming video now at times it would um stutter or literally jitter buffer and it's annoying you're hearing music and it glitches and it's annoying but you won't die right unlikely <laughs> okay uh, firm real time is in between hard real time is completely deterministic where we use an rtos so uh, i've already said it we always must meet deadlines otherwise it's disastrous and you know the examples are pretty obvious many kinds of transport so our modern cars they all support abs anti lock braking systems um it's an amazing technology right the wheels are braked at different points using quick calculations of the computer and therefore they prevent you flying off maybe an ic road stock exchanges are a great example of hard real time systems medical electronics you don't want the pacemaker in your heart to start having variance in how it beats it <laughs> right and so on and on uh, nowadays drones are probably a good example so um having said all this i i'd like to reiterate this fact where is linux our beloved linux operating system in all of this vanilla linux mainline linux is capable of soft real time but not capable of hard real time so um perhaps that's a bit of a disappointment hey i you know i came here because i thought we can do the really cool hard real time stuff with linux but now you're saying we can't well guess what we can and uh, 
that's an incredible thing guys that is as you know that is the power of open source right that's the beauty of open source i keep telling people because the source is open people have taken the source code and modified it to fulfill their objectives and a team of people did exactly that with vanilla linux converting it into an arthos but folks please hold on to your horses we'll come to that aspect of linux later in this presentation um before that i like us to you know gain more understanding of the process its state machine leading up to scheduling fundas and uh, how well to some extent how they are done we're not really going into the deep internals of it and then to actually write a multi threaded app which will perform as real time but of course soft real time okay so let's get going so guys um you know there is obviously some technical background necessary to understand these things um on linux we've got processes executing and um we all know what a process is it's really just an instance of a program in execution processes can be single or multi threaded a thread of course is an execution path within a process now um let me switch to my terminal window i've kept this open over here i'm i'm running on um, ubuntu linux folks uh, the standard 22.04 lts release and you can see it's the it's a very recent ubuntu kernel you can see it's 5.19. something based on that uh good so what what are we getting at if you use the ps command you will be able to see all processes alive ps minus a ps minus e will reveal that and of course on my box uh by the way i'm running linux natively on my laptop there there are many processes alive well many how many that's easy right now it's 378 uh but i'm sure you realize these are processes only we don't see their threads but you know with gnu ps the ps we are running um it's always possible to look up many many details so so let's look at um the threads of every process so guys the command is ps minus capital la <laughs> so you know think of los angeles and uh, let's go hollywood so folks this time you'll see a lot more and um, here they are so so here's the deal a new column has come up lightweight process in effect that's the thread so here's how you read this output if the pid and lwp match then it's the main thread of the process if the left hand side column the pid column repeats then it's multi threaded else it's single threaded right guys so so check this out it's it's pretty clear all these are single threaded they are in fact folks uh, as i'm sure many of you know besides system d which is of course our init manager the modern one on linux um all these threads that follow over here are actually kernel threads or k threads um just to quickly show you using the bsd style syntax psaux it's one way you see the processes that appear in square brackets they are kernel threads that that's a quick way to know so you know we do have a few dozen kernel threads alive on the system they are threads that run in kernel mode with kernel privilege they have some housekeeping to do they do it but the vast majority of processes and threads are in user mode it's it's pretty much always like that right um it's always user mode that's the resource hogger cpu memory network 
Discayo. It's pretty much always them that hog the resources. So anyway, coming back to Los Angeles, <laughs> PS minus LA, here's a list of all processes and threads. Now, uh, let's look. Are any repeating? We, we should come across some. Um, can you spot any? I haven't seen them yet. So let's scroll down further. Um, where are you? Where are you? Okay, I guess we see some now. Guys, check this out. So what does this tell us? It tells us here's a multi-threaded process. It's called Bolt Demon, uh, whatever the heck that is. There's a total of three threads. This is the main thread and these are their two worker threads. And uh, guys, we'll now start seeing many examples. Here, here's another multi-threaded process. I, I run an IoT service called Remote It. It's very good. And clearly it's multi-threaded and we'll find a lot more. Okay, cool. Um, also, you can see that the number of threads far outweighs the number of processes, which makes sense. Cool, so we come back here. So guys, now we're saying when a process executes, it goes through several well-known states that um, are being maintained by the Linux kernel. Uh, we need to understand this and the transitions between states, and we call it the state machine. So this diagram is from my system programming book. So let's check it out. Um, a process... You know, folks, let me interject with one thing. This equally applies to threads, okay? So a process or a thread is born. Now, the moment it's fully born, the Linux kernel makes it schedulable, which means it's a candidate for the CPU scheduler, which really means under the hood that it goes on to some kind of data structure called a run queue. Now, over here, you know, it perhaps looks to you like it's an array, but it's not perhaps an array. It could be anything. It could be linked lists. It could be a tree of some sort. Uh, frankly, it doesn't matter now. There is, a, there is a data structure, and once the process or the thread is on this data structure, it's in the ready-to-run state. In effect, it's like saying, I want to run give me the CPU. So the scheduler is the arbitrator. It's the one that decides among these guys on the run queue, who shall we run next? And it picks one of them and context switches to it. And that task is now running on the CPU, which I mention over here as our CPU, running on CPU. And this means ready to run. But you know what? The Linux OS sees this entire state as one state, not two, and it just calls it R. So now when I say it calls it R, um, what do I mean? Can we see this somewhere? Yes, we can. It's, it's the same thing. It's our good old PS. But instead of just running PS, use PS minus L, long listing, just like LS minus L and look up the second column. The second column is the state. So see guys, we see an R over here for PS itself. It means it's either ready to run or running. That's how we interpret it. So great, here's bash, our shell of course, and it's in the state S, what does that mean? That's what we're going to see. So once a process is running on the CPU, what happens? So guys, I show it like this. Several things can happen. Uh, usually it runs and runs. And often, not always, but pretty often, it hits what's called a blocking call or a blocking API. So guys, as I'm sure you know, uh, what, what does this mean? Um, a blocking call is one where the process is put into a sleep state that's denoted by this box over here. And uh, folks, under the hood, the reality is it's 
dequeued from the run queue and enqueued onto another type of data structure, which is called a wait queue. So wait queues, you can have any number of them because the kernel and or drivers will set this up. And a wait queue is associated with an event. Why? Because see, guys, um, it's blocking on an event, on something occurring. And until that something occurs, it waits. In other words, sleeps. So folks, uh, what do we mean sleep? There's, there's no comfy bed and pillow in the computer, right? <laughs> okay, forgive my stupid jokes. Um, sleep really means you are not a candidate for the CPU scheduler. You won't run, but you're very much alive. You're waiting for something to occur. For example, in a C program, if you call sleep five, the sleep function parameter five, what are you saying? You're saying, keep me asleep until five seconds elapse. The event you're waiting upon is the elapse of five seconds of time, right? So when that event occurs, the kernel or perhaps the underlying driver wakes you up. And when you wake up, you become runnable again. You are dequeued from the wait, wait queue and enqueued on a run queue. And now you're again a candidate to run and you will run in the near future. That's what it means. Okay. So a blocking call is a possibility. Hey, but check this out. There are two kinds of sleep or blocking. One is an interruptible sleep denoted by capital S. That's this guy, interruptible sleep. But another is an uninterruptible sleep denoted by capital D. So the meaning is with respect to signals. If you're in an interruptible sleep and a signal arrives, guys, I'm sure you know, all signals that the platform supports can be seen with kill minus L list. These are the signals that the Linux OS supports. So if any of these signals come, you will react when you're in the interruptible sleep. You will run the signal handler. It might kill you. It might stop you. Or you might run some custom code because you've installed a signal handler. However, if the driver or the kernel has put you into an uninterruptible sleep. It's, it's controllable via APIs, kernel level APIs, like wait event. If it puts you into this state, then no signal can disturb you, not even till minus nine. So that's about that. So coming back here, guys, what else can happen to us while we are running on the CPU? Besides going to sleep, we can be sent a signal, the stop signal. So, you know, this puts us into a state called the stop state denoted by the letter capital T. So folks, when we're in the stop state, we're frozen, suspended. We're definitely not dead. You, you should realize that, okay? And um, how, how would we get into the stop state? So guys, uh, signal number 19 is SIG stop and signal number 20 has the same effect, SIG T stop, terminal stop. And when you do, for example, control Z on the keyboard, it puts you into this state. I mean, sorry, it delivers the signal, which puts us into the stop state. <coughs> Beg your pardon. Give me a sec, guys. Right. Um, so we've stopped. If we stop, we're not running. So how do we continue? Well, the question answers itself. There's a signal called SIGCONT. That's the continue. And once you receive the signal, you again become runnable. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, how, how is this signal sent to us? Well, several ways. One of them is using the job control commands on the shell, FG or BG, foreground or background. They, under the hood, they deliver the SIG count. 
Guys, I won't go further into those things. Just look up job control to get more details. What else can happen to us over here? Well, the only other thing that can happen to us is that we die. And we're dead. That too is a you know state that we pass through. And on the way to death, there is a transient state called zombie. And you know, if you've been programming on Unix or Linux for long enough, you surely know about this. Uh, folks, it's not our topic here, so I won't delve into more of that. And we have to prevent zombies and all of that. And with Linux, it's really easy. But I will move ahead from here. Otherwise, we won't finish. So let's move forward. Having seen the state machine, let's now start understanding better regarding scheduling on the Linux OS. So guys, uh, here's a really key point. Um, just uh, think in your mind. If we have, for, for simplicity, let's say three processes alive, um, P1, P2, and P3. Now, P1 has one thread, it's single-threaded. P2 is multi-threaded with two threads, and P3 has three threads. And let's just for the moment assume all of them want to run. How do they compete for the CPU resource? Um, is it the processes that will get scheduled by the scheduler? Or is it the threads that compete for the CPU, the threads of the process? Or is it something like within a process the threads compete? Or is it something else altogether? So, you know, in effect, we're asking, what is the atomic unit of scheduling? What is it that the scheduler schedules? What is it that competes for the CPU resource? So in computer science, uh, this is called the KSE, the kernel schedulable entity. And it's very clear on the Linux OS, it's the thread. The thread is the KSE. So guys, this is very important to understand and internalize. So um, I've already said this. This is what a process is. And we know about these things. It's very much a Unix thing. But you know, multi-threading is a reality from a long while now. So we have processes as well as threads. And threads are an execution path within a process. Every process requires at least one thread because it's an execution path, right? It's what executes code. So minimally, you'll have one thread. And in fact, that thread is the main thread, also called the T0 thread. So guys, um, if we have more than one thread, then of course, it's a multi-threaded, abbreviated as MT process. Okay, so where, where is all this alive? We visualize them as being alive in a sandbox. Every process lives in a sandbox, what we call the virtual address space of the process. Um, have a look. This is the virtual address space, the user mode virtual address space of a process. So folks, without going into too many details, it begins at the low address zero and it goes to the high address. Um, though I'm not going to be te technically accurate, just for the sake of understanding, if we're on a 32-bit system, then the high address would be two to the power of 32, which of course is four gigabytes. If we're on a 64-bit Linux, then the high address would be 2 to the 64, which is an incredibly large number, 16 exabytes, 16 into 10 to the power of 18. Now, I, I just said this is not perfectly accurate. The reality is the virtual address space is shared between user mode and kernel mode. So the reality is that the kernel is on top here. So this is an in-between number. 
but guys in in this particular presentation i'm not delving into all of those details just keep it in the back of your mind okay because after all is said and done we are monolithic single piece of stone so we are one piece user mode and kernel mode in the entire virtual address space anyhow let's move along the virtual address space is divided into homogeneous regions known as segments uh, a better term is mappings each of these that you see here is a mapping so we have a mapping called text text is the machine code the instruction pointer or the pc iterates over this and that's how your code runs then we have the data segments there are three of them and we know the heap is a dynamic segment which grows towards higher virtual addresses the stack is at the top of the user mode virtual address space the stack of main and on all modern processors it's a processor feature we say it grows down towards lower virtual addresses um in between we have the library mappings because think about it even hello world wouldn't work if you can't map in the text and data of glibc so it is going to be mapped in and all this is done by the loader performing an mmap at the time of loading now this is just to give you an overview let's leave it at this okay so let's move on from here guys uh this is a reiteration of the previous points you know these things now and here we come to a key point regarding a little bit about kernel architecture on linux so see guys um the let's assume we have a multi threaded process so let's say we have three threads obviously the operating system has to track every process it does it uses a metadata structure called the process descriptor like you know the unix pcb but um it's terribly named though the name is process descriptor it doesn't track a process it tracks a thread belonging to a process so guys the reality is for every thread alive we have a metadata structure that the kernel uses to keep track of it to hold its attribute information it's colloquially known as the process descriptor but i'd prefer you to think about it as the task structure task is a much nicer word a thread is a task okay so every thread alive has its own kernel task structure now here's another thing we need a stack to support execution because it's the stack that holds execution context call frames are you know we say pushed and popped as you execute functions and return from them now when you're executing user mode stack uh, sorry user mode code you're using your user mode stack but the moment your thread issues a system call you switch to kernel mode and you begin to execute kernel code in the context of the same thread we call it process context now if we're executing code that includes functions right of course you're going to be calling functions don't we need a stack yeah for sure we can't use the user mode stack so guess what there's another stack allocated in the kernel for our usage when we're running in kernel mode and that's called the kernel mode stack it's important to understand the distinction okay so guys in a nutshell for every privilege level that the os supports we have a stack so our modern os is support two privilege levels user and kernel so we have two stacks a user mode stack and a kernel mode stack well every rule has an exception a kernel thread has only a kernel mode stack because it doesn't see user space only kernel space fine now um i put up a diagram here which i hope makes this clear let's visualize we've got three processes alive two of which are multi threaded and a few kernel threads that are alive 
Of course, guys, the picture is simplistic. There's a lot more to the kernel. But um, for our understanding, I think this is fine for now. So check this out. We've got P1, P2, P3 with different numbers of threads. And look at the mapping. In the kernel, there is a task struct representing this thread and there's a kernel mode stack. And because P2 has two threads, we've got two task structs for P2 and two kernel mode stacks. I haven't shown the user mode virtual address space or the user mode stack, which of course is part of it. Okay, I haven't shown it in this diagram. It would get too crowded. In this example, we've got five threads here. So we've got five task structs. I've shown three of them here and five kernel mode stacks. We've got kernel threads alive and running. Each kernel thread has a task struct and a kernel mode stack. It doesn't have a user space mapping. There is none. So folks, this I think is an important diagram. It helps us understand the basics of kernel architecture. Now, you know, since we are biased towards scheduling, <clears throat> the task struct contains all attributes of the process slash thread. It includes scheduling attributes. And I just um, refer to it as this yellow box named sched. So you can see in the legend here, internally, it will contain all kinds of scheduling attributes. And guys, I want you all to realize that, of course, you can look up all or any of this at the level of the code. I mean, again, the beauty of open source, right? So, so let's do one quick thing. I keep this website bookmarked. Um, Bootlin is wonderful. The company, it's a French company. And this is, they, they have an online kernel browsable system. Um, we're on the latest stable kernel here, but you can pretty much look up any kernel. So let's do one thing. Let's search for the task structure and it finds it and it's over here and we click on this it's in a header and check it out brilliant right here's the task struct and it's a big struct there are many members so guys this is per thread and all the attributes are over here well <laughs> it will take a lot longer than this presentation to explain these things i won't even try but um look at this Many of these members are to do with scheduling guys. Okay, which I'm sure you can see, fine. Um, we're going to refer to some of them, but we're not really going to go very deep into this, but a lot of stuff here is very relevant to scheduling as, as is kind of obvious by looking at it. So great, <clears throat> let's, let's come back here. Um, <clears throat> these things I've explained and um, I'm sure you understand. Guys, let me move along. So uh, here's the next key point. What are we after in this whole exercise of ours today? We want to know how on a per thread basis we can leverage the CPU scheduler. So are you starting to see all the scheduling attributes are in here, in the task struct. There must be an API, a way for me to query and set these attributes and therefore influence scheduling, CPU scheduling. Of course there is guys. The API necessarily has to cross the user kernel boundary. Therefore the API has to be a system call. There are multiple system calls which will allow us to fiddle with these things, to query and set them. Permissions also matter, and I'm going to talk about that. And you will also find that it's not just system calls. We've got pthread wrappers as well, POSIX thread wrappers, which obviously in turn issue the system calls. Cool. Let's keep going so that we reach the place where we can actually program these things and you know, try it out for ourselves and see. I, I always like to tell people, be empirical. Don't 
believe the book, the tutorial, the presentation, try it out for yourself and see. But you can believe me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep going, guys. So we, as the Linux OS, we conform to the POSIX standard. And there are POSIX scheduling policies. Uh, what are they? What do they mean? This is a key part of our discussion. So what, what exactly is a scheduling policy? Well, it's an algorithm. And it's been implemented in code within the Linux kernel sched branch. And um, it, it tells the OS how to schedule. Well, rather it implements it. Um, you know, when I was new to OS, OSs and Linux, I always thought that there's just one scheduler. But it turns out that it isn't like that. And with modern Linux, um, to an extent, these things are configurable and uh, very much in the hands of the app developer to be able to decide which scheduling policy shall I use for which thread. That is the real power. And that's what I'm trying to show you over here. So, so let's get down to it. Uh, what are the scheduling policies that we are supposed to support? These are the ones, guys. And these are the names given to them. Sched FIFO, RR, and other. Sched other is also called Sched normal. And is in fact the default scheduling policy, this last one. These are um, known as the POSIX scheduling policies. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, the Linux OS certainly supports these and it supports more as well. It has ones called sked batch and sked idle. Um, they are, well, honestly, they are not as important, um, especially sked batch. Sked idle is used. It's used when the machine or rather the CPU core is in an idle state. It only comes into play at that point in time. Right. Uh, as also, in the interest of completeness, there are even more, for example, the deadline scheduler, but I'm not considering those things here. We're going to focus on these. Okay. So now the obvious question is, um, I mean, probably in your mind, you're thinking, okay, you've told us that there are these three that are important, but I don't understand them. What do they mean? So let's get into that. So guys, um, I know there's probably a bit too much text here. This is an extract from my kernel programming book. And of course, I'll explain this. Um, <clears throat> we encapsulate the meaning of these scheduling policies in these tables. So let's let's talk about it. Let's begin, in fact, with sked FIFO. So guys, first thing to know, both sked FIFO and sked RR, which of course stands for round robin, are real time scheduling policies. That's the first key thing to know. And the second thing I'll say is a reiteration. When I use the word real time now, I mean soft real time, not hard real time. Because guys, we're talking vanilla Linux. It, it does support real time, but in the domain of soft soft real time, okay? So we always keep that in mind. So with that in mind, what, what do these policies, these algorithms, what do they buy us? So guys, think of it this way. If you make a thread run under the sked FIFO policy, and I'll show you how to do that. Once it's running on CPU, remember the state machine, our CPU, once it's running on CPU, it will only get thrown off the CPU under three circumstances. What are they? Those are mentioned over here. One, it blocks on IO. In other words, it hits a blocking call, sorry, a blocking call, it goes into a sleep state. Two, it gets stopped or it dies. Well, obviously, then it is off CPU. And three, and you know, the really interesting case, 
the moment a higher priority real time thread becomes runnable, it will preempt it. Okay. So, interesting. But what are the priorities? I'm getting to that in a moment. Hang on. Um, what about SCEDRR? If this is SCED free for behavior, then what's the difference with SCEDRR? It's like this. It's identical to SCED free for, except that it has a finite time slice. Guys, did you notice? I never mentioned the word time slice when I talked about SCED free for, but doesn't everyone talk about time slice when we talk about scheduling? Well, I mean, see again, that's the beauty of this algo. With SCED FIFO, you get infinite time slice. In effect, no, what we what we come to realize is that a SCED FIFO task is a very aggressive task. It latches onto a CPU and it hangs on. It doesn't want to relinquish it. If one of these three things happen, it will relinquish it, but it's not about time slice. But RR is a bit more polite. When the time slice is used up, that's another reason to get preempted. So what is the time slice? On the Linux OS, all these things are tunable. The default tends to be 100 milliseconds on a you know typical Linux, okay? But of course, these things are tunable via the PROC, what's called syscontrol features. Uh, we'll see a little bit of that later. So great. Um, they are really the same thing, but RR also has a time slice. Now, it's important to remember that neither of these policies is the default when you create a thread. So what is? It's this one, sked other or sked normal. So guys, the moment you create a process slash thread, it defaults to this policy unless the parent is of another policy and it inherits the scheduling policy. But, but let's consider the default case where that isn't the case. So when you create a thread, it becomes sked other or sked normal. And what does it mean? It means it's very much non real time. It's not real time. So what is the algorithm? It's a fairness based algorithm. It's all about overall throughput, prevention of starvation of any thread. In fact, the algo used on modern Linux and, and from a very long while now is called CFS, the completely fair scheduler. And in the Linux kernel, we call it a class. We have these modular scheduling classes. So the CFS class serves this policy and it's all about fairness. Now guys, um, these uh, things are mentioned over here. And I've also mentioned batch and idle and they are less important to our discussion. Now, all of this discussion is not going to be meaningful unless we understand prioritization and priority levels. So here's a simple way to look at it. The y-axis is the real-time priority. And look, clearly, SCED FIFO and SCED RR, they are peers. They are soft real-time. And of inferior priority to them are all the non-real-time threads on the OS which includes the SCED other, which is always the default policy. And of course includes these. Okay, so having seen that, now let's figure out priorities. So guys, we have a priority scale and the priority scale for real-time threads, which of course means soft real-time, is from one to 99 with one being the least and 99 being the highest priority. So here we are. One is the lowest real-time priority and 99 is the highest. And this is for these policies. Okay, that's fine. But by default, a thread is never these. It's always sked other or sked normal. If that's the case, what is its real-time priority? Quite logically, its real-time priority is zero. So guys, think about it. 
if more if if one or more real time threads soft real time threads are alive and runnable they will always be favored by the scheduler to a non real time thread they will always win because they're always of superior priority as the non real time is zero okay now that's fine and that's what we expect but you might well ask um within non real time i i have most of my application threads can i have relative prioritization between them and isn't that important of course it is we need to be able to prioritize among the non real time threads it's a it's a dumb thing it's an old unix facility called the nice value of a process or a thread it's a bit peculiar guys uh this is how the nice value scale works it goes from minus 20 to plus 19 with a default of 0 that's the base value that everyone starts at unless you program it to be something else plus 19 is the worst minus 20 is the best if you are non root in terms of permissions you can only make it worse so if you make your nice value plus 5 you can't even come back to zero you can only make it worse than 5 but if you are root you can do anything you can make it better uh that's why it's called nice value guys by the regular user can only manipulate it to make his or her prioritization worse therefore being nice to others i guess it's the unix chaps idea of a joke okay cool um let's move on i hope you've got this guys so moving along you know there's a lot of utilities on unix and linux and of course i'm talking about linux um to make it easy for us to script these things and to try these things out on an interactive shell one of the utilities is called nice we can set the nice value guys uh, since you know let, let's try it out since we are in the mood to try things out okay so um let's do one thing let's do nice minus 5 and let's run something so folks i'm i'm going to do a silly thing i'm going to run vi in the background okay now it's running but it got stopped because you can't run an editor in the background but regardless i i don't really care the point here is that vi is alive and well it stopped but look at this its nice value is plus 5 uh guys be careful this is the hyphen switch this is not the minus sign so if you wanted to make it minus 5 you do nice minus minus 5 okay but you might say he he is already alive so now what do i do so now we use the renice renice affects a process that's already alive so we can say minus minus 5 on this process um i guess i did it wrong okay folks sorry about that i don't want to spend <laughs> excuse me but i don't want to spend too much time on this actually the point i'm trying to show is this um if we try and run something at minus 5 it fails because we're not running as root but the moment we run as root it succeeds and now we are running ps at minus 5 a nice value of minus 5 um look up the man page for renice and learn how to use it so i i did it wrong you do it right i'll leave it to you good excuse right <laughs> okay let's let's move along uh folks there are sorry about that there are many useful utilities one of them is called change real time okay um in fact robert love and perhaps collaborators wrote this utility and uh, it's very useful so you know whenever you come across a new 
utility or whatever, please look up the man page. In fact, we're going to use it, but it's so easy. You can set the scheduling policy as well as priority for a given PID, or you can query. So we're going to make use of this guy. These things are just valuable, okay? And they even allow us to script these things. You can write a script which does this on your product. Why not? Okay, you think of the possibilities. So moving along, um, I'm sure you've heard of CPU affinity. If I, if I have four CPU cores, by default, okay, let me say this before jumping into this. The Linux scheduler, CPU scheduler um, is, you know, there's a nice statement. It's perfectly SMP scalable which means for each live CPU on the system, we have a run queue and the kernel scheduler treats it as a different unit and will perform scheduling independently on each CPU core. Therefore, taking advantage of every core on your multi-core box, leveraging it. And I mean, this buys us parallelism, which is exactly why we spend all this money on multi-core, multi-processor, SMP, and software effort in writing multi-threaded apps and a multi-threaded kernel like Linux. Okay, so let's say we have four cores. Um, by default, when you run a process or a thread, and guys, let's get into the habit of saying thread because we know the thread is the KSE. When you run a thread, it can run on any of those cores that is denoted by having the CPU affinity bit mask set to 1111 binary, which is hex F. So you understand, right? That means it can run on core 0, 1, 2, or 3. Yeah, um, but guess what? It's in our hands as the owner of the process or thread to change that. And of course, there's a system call interface but there's an easier interface. It's the utility called task set. With task set, we can change the CPU affinity mask. And that's wonderful. So see guys, the help screen of task set shows us an example. We can query it, we can set it. So 03 is the bit mask. You understand, right? 03 in binary is 011. So we can run on co zero and on co one but no other goals. And the OS scheduler will honor this. That's a pretty powerful thing. Uh, folks, a word of advice. It sounds tempting to kind of, you know, start putting our own bit masks for affinity mask and therefore controlling things. But you know, unless you really know what you're doing, unless you have a broad strategy, um, leave it to the OS. It will do the best job of deciding on which core to run a task. It will load balance. It understands the CPU domain. Um, you're pretty well off leaving it alone in the general case. Okay, fine guys. Um, I wrote a wrapper script called query task sched and internally it uses CHRT and task set and it displays all these things to us. I think this is a good time. Let's let's grab a look at it, okay? So uh, folks, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, this um, is the GitHub site, guys. And um, I'll, I'll put the latest version of everything over here by the time you see it, worry not. And um, I'm going to use code from here. In fact, I'm within that folder. So I'll switch to the source directory, scripts directory. There's just one script. Um, why don't we just run it? Uh, I Hang on a sec. I have, you know, many threads alive. It's going to query several things in the domain of scheduling about them. So let's run it and look at the output. So folks, um, a lot of output and we'll interpret these columns. 
So, of course, because I've got so many threads alive, you can see it. In fact, it's quite easy, right? This is the PID. This is the LWP. And I've even um, indented the output so that you can see this is the main thread and these are the worker threads. Okay. Uh, you can see these are the worker threads. This is the name of the thread. So you can see, in fact, this is the one of the Chrome processes and these are its worker threads. You can see that they're all running as get other. It's the default. And guys, just look, by far, sked other will tend to be the policy because it is always the default. And, you know, here's the proof. Coming back here, the next column is the real-time priority. And of course, it's zero because these aren't real-time. They're non-real-time threads. And any guesses, guys? What is FFF? It's the CPU affinity mask, of course, because look, my my laptop has 12 CPU cores. So think about it, guys. 12 ones in binary is 0x FFF. It means that all these threads can run on any of the available cores. But as another example, this particular thread, in fact, it's a kernel thread. It can run only on core number one. Core numbering starts at zero. Over here, it's different. Over here, it's different. And you will find that occurring, especially with things like kernel threads. It's pretty commonplace to, you know, isolate them to perhaps one core. That's that's fairly common. Okay. So guys, just look. The majority tends to be sked other. The majority of threads alive. And of course, this is a desktop Linux. Perhaps on your embedded Linux, it's not exactly like this. But folks, it tends to be the rule rather than the exception. I'll keep scrolling up. And uh, when we get to the higher numbers, you'll start seeing some changes. So let's, let's look at this example. We have PID 290. As a matter of fact, it's a kernel thread. It's called an IRQ thread. It runs at SCED FIFO priority 50. And I put this asterisk here to catch our eye. It means it's a real-time thread. So the moment you see an asterisk, these are real-time threads. So guys, interesting, right? The SCED FIFO thread runs at priority 50, exactly halfway between 1 and 99. That's very deliberate. This is a feature of real-time Linux that has been backported to regular kernels that we all use. This feature is called the threaded interrupt. Uh, guys, that's beyond the scope of this presentation, so I won't dive into this further. But, you know, look it up. For example, on my box, to serve the Wi-Fi, these are all threaded interrupts. And in fact, they run on different CPUs to give more throughput on TX and RX. It's to do with interrupt processing. And you'll find other examples. So here we have a watchdog demon that is again happening to be at priority 50. And look at this. I put three asterisks to catch your eye. Why? Because these are kernel threads running at SCED FIFO 99. So you might say, whoa, <laughs> 99, this guy must be hogging the CPU. Uh, hang on, guys. It's... It doesn't work that way. See, see, think, think for a moment. Um, this thread is to do with migrating, you know, threads to other CPUs when the need arises. So that's the key point. These threads don't run continually. In fact, the majority of the time they'll be asleep. But when they are woken up by the kernel, it's pretty much guaranteed they will run more or less instantly preempting everything else because they are SCED FIFO 99. So folks, in a way, that is one of the really key points I'm trying to drive at in this presentation. It's up to you. As the app developer, you can set your real-time threads to SCED FIFO 99 if they are very important. If when they wake up, 
they must run and with priority right that that is the point so you know you will you will find a few kernel threads that run at 99 it's it's not going to be too many of them and they tend to be very specialized so here we are guys and the header shows you these things that i've already mentioned cool so let's come back here um yeah you can you can get the script here and uh, I just showed you this. This is a screenshot of a sample run on my box. Try it out on your box, guys. Um, I don't have to say it. Always be hands-on, be empirical, try things out. Righto. So uh, let's, let's get a move on. It's getting on time. Um, how do we get where we want to get? How do we query our set and individual threads, scheduling policy, and or priority. So folks, we have APIs, pthread and system calls. Um, this is kind of obvious stuff. Let's move along. Let's talk about pthread APIs because um, that is how we intend to do it in this presentation. So folks, let's get down to brass tacks. Here we are. Uh, we have an API, pthread get sched param, get scheduling parameters. Of course, you'll, you'll remember that three in brackets means section three of the manual. Guys, a quick, a quick revision. You know, I like this about Unix and Linux. You want help on man, it's man, man. And these are the nine sections of the manual. Section nine is a bit of a lie. Section two is system calls, section three is library calls, and so on. So if we do this, you, you see it is section three of the manual, which means it's a library API, and here are the details. And of course, I'm going to explain this, folks. Okay, so let's come back here. This API allows us to query the scheduling policy and priority of any given thread well, within our application. And this does the complement. It allows us to set the scheduling policy and priority. Okay, um, it should be obvious. Querying is fine, but setting needs special permission. You either need to be running as root or guys, you, I, I hope you've heard of the modern POSIX capabilities model. It's a really powerful thing where we split up traditional root permissions into a bit mask of much finer granularity permissions called capabilities. In fact, it's nothing new. I, I shouldn't use the word new. It's been there for decades. Unfortunately, many aren't aware of them and are therefore not using them as much as we should. Uh, guys, I recommend you look up MAN7 capabilities and read this page. These are the capability bits. They all start with cap, cap for capability, cap underscore foo. As an example, if you have this capability in your process, you can change the ownership of any file object. You don't need root. Of course, by default, all processes have no capabilities. And folks, we have utilities to look up these things, get cap and set cap. In fact, we will use them. Okay. So what I'm getting at is root is nowadays considered like the older way. And to be honest, the less secure way, because running as root attracts hackers, malicious hackers. So we really don't want that. Just giving a few capabilities, you know, it's the InfoSec principle of, um, it's called the POLP principle, the principle of least privilege. Run your app with the least privileges that it needs. And we can enforce this with the capabilities model. So coming back here, guys, um, besides root, you can use this capability, CAPSIS-NICE, and 
it will give the process or thread the capability to set to set scheduling policy and priority. You don't need root. So that's wonderful. And I'll show you a demo of this doing the set cap. So guys, now we are starting to learn these things. Besides pthread APIs, there are system calls. And obviously, this is these are the kinds of calls that the pthread wrappers invoke to actually get the job done. Because remember, under the hood, the job is done at the level of the task struct. And only a system call can get us there. So these are available APIs to set and to get. The set attribute and the get attribute are considered the modern ones, sked underscore set and get. But there are others and you are free to use any of these. Look up the man page, okay? So same thing folks, obviously. Um, on Ubuntu Linux, I, I find a nice thing doing a man minus k, k for keyword, sked. Let's just do it, right? Be empirical. This is nice. It shows us all scheduler related man pages. So guys, you know, we can learn stuff from this. Okay. I'll leave it to you to look it up in detail. Uh, the page on SCED section seven informational is good. Check it out. Fine. Uh, folks, <laughs> this is from my system programming book, pretty much showing you the same thing. Okay. And these are explained in greater detail in that book. I know too much marketing. Let's move on. Um, here's the signature. So guys, we want to write code. Let's get down. Um, include the header pthread.h. This is pthread set sked param. It's got three parameters. What do the parameters mean? Uh, this is the get. Same three parameters. Uh, but of course, over here, this is a return value. So the first parameter is the thread. The one you want to query or set, you give the thread ID. Okay, the pthread type. The second parameter um, is policy. And, you know, this is a key thing, obviously. This is where we specify the scheduling policy or we get it returned. It will be one of sched FIFO, RR, other, or even these. And the third parameter is a pointer to a struct of type sched param. So guys, um, as of today, the struct sked param has only one member and that member is the scheduling priority. And we mean the real time priority. So you remember the scale one to 99? That's what we're talking about. Okay, and of course, zero means non-real time. Okay, and in that case, you should be using nice value if you want to prioritize. All right, uh, this I have already told you. There are many related APIs. I, of course, have to leave it to you to look up if you're interested. Okay, and there are interesting things. Get the min priority, get the max priority for a given policy. We have system calls to do all these things. Um, let's get on with it. So guys, we've reached the point where, you know, let's make this whole thing practical. Let's learn some, I mean, look through some code and then let's run it. Okay. So folks, <clears throat> this is all on the GitHub site. You can see this is the demo app. Um, this is the code, and I wrote a small wrapper script to make it easy to try. There's a small header, there's a make file to build it. So great, let's um, actually get into this. So folks, um, oops, I'm going to do a make clean. And here we are. So. I'm going to open the code in an editor and let's keep it here. 
And uh, what is our intention? So let me explain that first. So our intention in this demo, we'll create a process. I mean, that's what runs. And we will be placed in main. Main is the first thread. Inside main, we're going to create two threads using the pthread create API. And um, let's, let's think of them as T1 and T2. We are going to use the pthread APIs. You remember uh, pthread set sked param. We're going to make the threads real time, which of course means soft real time. We're going to give them a scheduling policy of sked FIFO. We're going to give them a priority and the priority we give them, you will decide. You'll pass it on the command line as a parameter, a number between one and 99. Okay. Now, to actually see that they are real time. I mean, we'd like to be able to visualize this stuff. So what I do in the code is I, I write a small macro and I run that macro. It executes a for loop. And in that loop, it emits a character to the screen using the write system call. So we'll make it write, we'll make the T1 thread write number two and we'll make the T2 thread write number three. The idea being you're watching the second thread execute, you're watching the third thread execute. So when you see twos coming, the second thread is executing. When you see threes coming, the third thread is executing. And after main completes this job, hey, by the way, we're going to run them at deferring priorities. So you will also see the preemption. After main finishes that, it's going to call that same macro delay loop and it's going to print M for main onto the console. Okay. You will find that it won't get a chance until the real time threads finish, which is the whole point of this discussion, prioritization. So guys, let's look at the code. So I, I you know, don't, don't have the time to read every line and you don't need me to. We all know C programming. And I'm assuming you have, um, you know, uh, an appreciation of pthread programming, at least the basics. So, so folks, let's check this out. In main, these are our local variables and, you know, you're expected to pass the priority. <clears throat> Excuse me. the real-time priority. So guys, um, we query the minimum priority of sked FIFO. It turns out to be the number one. We query the max. It turns out to be the number 99. We print it out. Guys, this message is just a macro which emits a debug print. All that is simple enough. Over here, we get the priority value. I have a to-do. And it's important. We must use superior APIs to prevent IOF bugs, integer overflow, stuff like that. It's very important in production. But over here, it's fine as a demo. Now, um, let's let's look at the nitty gritty. Over here, I call pthread create. And guys, as I'm sure you know, this is the thread ID and this is the thread. This is the life and scope of the thread we create. This is the parameter we pass it, the priority parameter, the number between one and 99 that you passed. We do exactly the same thing here. We call it P3 and the function is thread P3, the life and scope of another thread. So guys, and, and we pass the same thing, the priority. Let's have a look at this code. Let's have a look at the code of thread P2 to begin with. Here it is. So see, We've got a local variable stuck sked param p. And folks, as you know, threads run in parallel. So the moment main creates this thread, it will start executing. And we will come here. This printf will get emitted. Now, I very deliberately go to sleep for two seconds. Remember the state machine? We're in a blocking call. You know why? This allows the main thread some time, a chance to print a few M's for main onto the console. After two seconds, it'll wake up 
it sets the priority to whatever you passed. Okay. Like, let's say we pass the number 30, priority 30. So its priority will become 30. And then the, the key part of this program, we invoke the pthread API. And guys, as the comment says, it becomes a system call. In this case, sked set scheduler. So we do pthread set sked param. The first parameter is the thread ID, pthread self on myself. The second parameter is the policy, sked FIFO, right? It's soft real time. And the third parameter is the pointer to the struct, which contains the priority. <clears throat> so folks, by the time this call is through, assuming it succeeds, you are running as real time. This thread is running at real time with a certain real time priority, let's say 30. Now we emit a small print and we call my delay loop macro. Guys, all this is in the header file. It's easy to study the code. It prints the character two in a tight loop 350 times. Hey, one more point. You should not compile this program in an optimized fashion because it kind of defeats the purpose. <clears throat> By compiling it for debug with minus O zero as well, you will actually see these prints being emitted. And that's what I'll do. After it pre finishes printing two, it will die. It will terminate. Now folks, the code of the second thread is pretty much identical with a key difference. The difference is after getting the priority value, let's say 30, um, after getting the priority, I bump up the priority by 10 points. Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting. So this thread is going to have a higher priority, but hang on, it hasn't taken effect yet. It's still running as sked other, sked normal. We set the member in the struct and now it takes effect. P thread set sked param on myself, this thread sked FIFO ampersand P. Now, assuming this call is successful, it is running at a higher priority. Shouldn't it preempt it? It should, but look what we do. We make it sleep for four seconds. So don't you see, we deliberately hit a blocking call going off CPU, allowing this thread, this guy to print twos, the number two, well, the character two, to the console for some time. So guys, in effect, once this wakes up, it is definitely going to preempt this guy. It's going to run printing the character three to the terminal in this demo 210 times. And only when it finishes, it will die. And only then will this guy continue. And only when this guy dies, will main come over here and print the character M to the terminal 400 times. That is the code. So now let's run it. So see folks, um, I'll leave it to you to examine the make file. It's, it is kind of detailed and it's a style of make file that I like to call a better make file template. Please read through it and I'm sure you'll understand. I use it in my books as well. Have a look, but I don't want to focus on that. We don't have too much time left. So here's what I'll do. I'll build it. Now, there are a few warnings and guys, um, it's very pedantic. I am going to ignore it for now. The make file is running the set cap utility as root. And here is where we set the capability caps is nice onto our binary executable. We need to do this as root, of course. It's done and our programs are ready. Okay, so folks, a quick LS. I should run the debug version. We'll, we'll ignore the other versions, guys. So let's do that. Sked, pthread, rt, prio, debug. When we run it, 
it asks for the real time priority as a parameter. So folks, uh, what did we say? Let's pass 30. Now let's have a look at the output. Uh, remember, what should it do? Main should run, we should see a few M's. After that, it creates the threads which make themselves sked free for real time. Thread two should emit two preempting pre the M's. And after two seconds, thread three should print threes, preempting the twos. And when it dies, we should see the twos. And when it dies, we should see the M's. But don't believe what I say. Be empirical. Try it out. Here's the M's. Ah, it's working, but not how we expect. See, guys, this is, I mean, it's nice, but this is not what we expected. Do you see the interleaving? We can literally see thread 2 and thread M, which is the main thread, running in parallel. And the moment this thread comes alive, even it is running in parallel. Now, I mean, in a way, that's a nice demo, okay, of parallelism, but this is not what we expected. Huh, by the way, all this is fine, but look, read the output carefully. To run this as soft real time, we need to run it either as super user or having capsis nice. Now we do have capsis nice, but it still doesn't seem to work. What's wrong? Guys, think about it. We are running on a multi-core system. The Linux kernel has the intelligence to merely place the second and third thread onto another core. That's why they're all running on parallel. I mean, in parallel. So nothing has gone wrong here. In fact, it's taken advantage of our hardware. Because remember, I've, I've got 12 cores. It's got more than enough to run three threads. That's why they're running in parallel. So guys, don't you see? To get our demo to work, we need to guarantee that all these threads run on exactly one core. And how do we do that? By changing the CPU affinity mask. Now, I could do it programmatically, but it's a bit of a headache. I mean, see guys, I remind you, man minus k sked, and uh, we will find it. Um, where has it gone? Here we are. This is the get affinity. This is the set affinity. So we can do it. These are system calls. But you know what? It's much easier with task set. So with task set, we can use syntax and we can do it. So guys, let's run again. And hey, I, I forgot to show you all something. Get cap on our binary executable proves that we are running with the capsis nice capability bit, which means we don't need root. It will still work. So that's good. That's good to know. Now, this is how we ran it earlier. But now, let's do this. This is one way, guys. You know what I'm saying? Run it with CPU affinity mask, zero, one. So guys, um, okay, to make it a bit more interesting, shall we say zero, two? What is zero, two in binary? It's zero, one, zero, which really means it will run on CPU one, the second CPU core on my box. And now let's see how it works. So here we go. Here's main. Aha, uh -huh. it's working. Here's main again. And it finished. So folks, now do you see? Main ran in the two seconds available to it. But then thread P2 woke up and preempted main because it ran as real time. Guys, remember the code? Thread P2 ran as real time with a priority of 30. So it preempted main. It kept running until another two seconds elapsed 
because you know of the sleep foe. This guy woke up and printed three at a higher priority. Real-time priority 40, 30 plus 10. It preempted it, not giving a chance. So it ran and only when it died did thread 2 come back and only when it died did the main thread come back and print M4 main and then it died and we are back to our shell. So folks, that's the demo. Okay, I hope um, this shows you and gives you ideas for your own apps, how you can leverage the CPU scheduler and make individual threads run as real time. Of course, soft real time. Guys, I'll need to hurry a bit. So we come back here. This is a screenshot of the same demo. But you know, one thing, let me, let me go back. One thing that uh, didn't happen in my demo run because I missed doing something to be honest. Guys, you know, very often, you will see the main thread suddenly appearing. Do you see the M's over here? It's because of a CPU tunable, well, a scheduling tunable. And I will explain that now. Um, PROC allows us to tune the kernel using syscontrol. One of the tunables among the many for scheduling is called SCEDRT period US. This is not the US, this is microseconds, U for mu, right? So guys, we call this the total period and we call this the runtime. The runtime value is the amount of time with respect to the total that a real-time thread will be allowed to run. So let's look up the values. The default values on your typical desktop Linux and you know any Linux, as far as I know, will be these numbers. So see guys, this is 1 million microseconds. This is 950,000. In effect, what we are saying is out of so many microseconds, for this many microseconds, only real-time threads will run on the CPU. In other words, 95% of CPU bandwidth is allotted to real-time threads. But you might correctly say, shouldn't it be 100%? Well, technically, yes, because that's the meaning of real-time. Real-time means we don't care about fairness. We are ruthless. But you know, this is Linux. It's a GPOS. So the default behavior is to literally leak 5% of CPU time to non-real-time threads, allowing them to run. So guys, um, on my box, I to be honest, I forgot. I had set this value earlier. Uh, let's let's look it up, right? This is the period, and this is the runtime. I had set the runtime to the same as the period, which is why no leakage occurred. So, guys, we can change that. So, here's my next demo. I'll echo nine zero 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 zero. 900,000 to this to leak 10% of CPU time to non-real-time threads. But this will fail. It will fail because of permissions. So of course, guys, you have to do it like this as root and note the syntax. Let's check. Yes. So um, do you agree with me, guys? The period is 1 million, but the runtime is 900,000. So I'll run the same demo, but this time we will have some leakage, CPU time leakage. The main thread will have the ability to peek in. Let's try it out. Let's be empirical. Here's main, here's thread two, but look, main came in, main came in. 
it leaked. See? Interesting, right? So, folks, this is in your hands. You decide how much CPU you want to leak to non-real-time threads because, you know, we don't want them to completely starve. Perhaps this is all dependent on your project or your product, obviously, and you make the decision. It's part of the design. Okay, so folks, uh, these things are reiterated in this presentation. Um, I wrote a script, a wrapper script called run it, just do run it dot sh minus h, and it'll explain how you can do these things. It, it has the intelligence to do these demos. Okay, so I leave it to you to run these things and try it out. Here's essentially a similar demo to what I showed you. Here we are showing no leakage. Okay, so fair enough. So guys, I have only a few minutes left. I hope you're still interested. Um, a few more things to cover, guys. You know, the modern initialization manager on Linux is called systemd. With systemd, we can spawn, we can run services at boot. And whether it's an enterprise class server or whether it's a small embedded Linux, this is the preferred way to run stuff at boot. This is the modern way. The reason I bring up systemd over here is that a lot of tuning can be done with respect to CPU scheduling. And it's without the need for any programming. So it's um, really powerful stuff. You can take advantage of this as well. So guys, I'm not going into details here. I'm just giving you a very brief overview. So this is really the key man page to look up for the stuff I'm showing you. Systemd.exec section five of the manual, which is file formats and check it out. You can give parameters like what's the CPU scheduling policy to run a service under, meaning a process. You can choose one of these. I mean, look how easy it is. No programming involved. Just write it in the so-called service unit. Of course, you have to learn how to use systemd. Uh, there are many tutorials out there. Just Google it or chat GPT. <laughs> okay, you can set the nice value. You can set the priority. So this makes it really easy, guys. And in fact, here's an example. Okay, you can set the CPU affinity mask. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. We know about resource limits on Linux. Every process has a set of default resource limits, like, you know, CPU time, memory limits, IO, and so on. Even those are settable from within system D for the services you are launching. So again, um, it makes it really easy for us guys. We can set these things. You can set CPU bandwidth as a percentage. Imagine that. So folks under the hood, right? System D leverages a really powerful infrastructure of the modern Linux kernel control groups or C groups. And C groups gives us the ability to do bandwidth control on resources like CPU, memory, network, disk IO, and so on. Again, C groups is something else to study and appreciate. It's really powerful stuff. You can even set the capabilities of the process you're launching via systemd. So guys, a um, lot of things. Now, I hope I've taught you a lot of stuff. So now I'm going to give you exercises. <laughs> I am a teacher, right? So guys, um, this is for the fun of it. This is in fact from my system programming book, one of the chapters on scheduling and this is all up to you. Have fun looking through this stuff and trying it out. Let's move along. So guys, the final section in this presentation, I hope you're still there. Um, right at the beginning, I said, we have a GPOS, general purpose OS Linux. We have 
soft real time linux easy easily qualifies we have firm real time and we have hard real time now linux is not an arthos hard real time but we can convert it um this is not meant to delve into depth it's an overview but you know you can get started so guys um in terms of the theory behind it um linux conforms to a scheduling scheme that we can call fixed priority preemptive scheduling so just look at the words we know what priority means we have a priority scale from 1 to 99 for real time fixed priority means it's up to the app designer or developer to fix the priority of individual threads in the process the os will honor it the os is not going to modify the priorities you will do it as the app designer or developer and and that's very powerful similarly with the nice values for the non real time threads okay so that that's a big deal guys it allows us to say among the 10 threads in my application three of them are sked fifo with priorities 50 60 and 70 perhaps one of them is sked rr with priority 65 and the remainder are non real time default but i can fix the nice values even for that we've got api okay so anyway we have the word preemptive coming up here guys we know we know what preemption means and i mean this is wikipedia's definition uh, we we understand these things so um what i want to say here is um there are two kinds of preemption user mode preemption and kernel mode uh when we say preemption often we are thinking of user mode so guys consider this we are running on linux we have one cpu to keep things simple um you write a c program whose one line of code is while one semicolon you compile it and run it in the background and we have just one cpu and we have a graphical desktop and we run a analog clock application so you can see the seconds hand of the clock ticking along uh, we can visualize this right it's easy to visualize tell me something when the while one is running will the second hand of the clock stop ticking because the while one is eating up all cpu quiz question what do you think so guys after a little thought and do think about it you will realize and and i encourage you to try it you'll see that the second hand keeps ticking why because folks it's the basis of a modern os scheduler it has the ability to preempt tasks which hog an unfair share of the cpu in fact the while one is terribly unfair so it's going to be penalized as a matter of fact um if you know about cfs it will go to the right of the rb tree and won't run for a while it will be deliberately penalized it's a question of karma okay you be a naughty boy and you'll be penalized you sip on the cpu and you'll get it more often it's exactly how we expect it should be so that's wonderful but now i ask you the next question what if i write a kernel module with the code in the in its section as while one semicolon and i have one cpu well you've pretty much had it because you know how can the kernel preempt itself right but guess what from the 2.6 linux scheduler and of course 2.6 is modern linux we kind of advertise two big features of this linux kernel one of the features was the o1 scheduler the big o1 scheduler which meant meant it was kind of real time ish 
And the other feature was that you could configure it to be preemptible. And of course, it's the case today. We can configure the Linux kernel to be preemptible. And guys, in the latest kernels, the 6.x, um, it's become even more tunable with a preempt dynamic feature coming up or just come up. Um, to begin understanding these things, um, I like this slide, which um, I've taken from an existing presentation. So, you know, all credit to these people who built this slide. It's a really nice slide. So guys, look at this slide. It shows us how kernel preemption has evolved from old Linux kernels to modern ones. The red color means non-preemptible section of the kernel in our really old kernels. And even up to 2.4 Linux, the vast majority of the kernel was non-preemptible. But from 2.6 Linux, a large percentage of the kernel became preemptible. Why do we say 2.4? Because it got backported. Companies like Red Hat saw the advantage and immediately backported it um, to serve their customers. So this is this is good stuff. It actually is great for you know multimedia rich systems, stuff like that. It's not really something we'd want on server class machines. We don't really need a preemptible kernel for that purpose. Okay. Um, it's more for the high-end multimedia rich, you know, high-end desktops, laptops, smartphones as well. Okay. From 2.6.18, guess what? We have patches, which if we apply and build the kernel, configure and build, we get a real-time kernel, hard real-time, RTOS. And with that in hand, it's almost 100% preemptible. Real-time Linux. Okay. So guys, um, it's evolved like this. It has led to the creation of hard real-time Linux. The project is called RTL, real-time Linux. Okay. So, uh, okay. So Linus has made this statement a long time back. You know, in its early years, this effort was called preempt RT, preempt real-time. So more on that. So guys, it's amazing. Thomas Gleeksner, he was passionate about converting Linux to an RTOS. In fact, I met Thomas very briefly at a conference in Bangalore, India, where I live, but many years back. And of course, he would have forgotten. Um, and he gave us a wonderful talk so many years back. And uh, they have worked on this from a long time. And right, you know, back in September 2006 with 2618, the patches were merged. Well, uh, hang on a sec. Patches were made available to convert Linux into an RTOS. So why do I keep saying patches? It's, it's not in mainline. Yes, it's not in mainline. And, you know, Linus and the others re resist pushing them into mainline. Why? Isn't it a good thing? Well, depends where you are in the ecosystem. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, see, folks, um, for, for Linux, Linux has never been designed as needing to be an RTOS. So he's right. We don't want highly invasive patches which convert it into an RTOS and change a lot of stuff. So it is an external patch out of tree that you have to download and apply. <coughs> Sorry. And then you can configure, build the kernel and deploy it and you are running an RTOS. But it's not in mainline. But guess what? In recent years, it's been getting closer and closer. And the hope is that it will soon be in mainline, which has always been a goal of the project. 
the original effort was called preempt RT. A very positive thing happened in 2015. The Linux Foundation adopted it as a project. And it's now called the RTL Collaborative Project. Okay, guys, don't confuse RTL with earlier approaches. And, you know, there was an earlier one called RT Linux. It's, it's all different. This is the modern one. Okay. So um, these are things that have changed within the kernel because of RTL. You know, the reality is RTL has brought up so many goodies that they have been backported into the mainline kernel, into the vanilla kernel. We owe thanks to Thomas Glixner and team for modern features like high resolution timers, threaded interrupts, priority inheritance, and so on. Um, it's all been backported and it gives us a better kernel. So RTL becoming part of mainline is something that I think will happen. So anyway, um, you want to run Linux as an RTOS. Maybe you have a drone project up your sleeve. Wonderful. You can read up about it here. There's a good wiki site. And here's a quick screenshot. They, they you know, have a blog and it's, it's very nice. There is an older wiki site, which I now find um, a, a lot of it has been deprecated. But, you know, you'll still find some articles here which are very good. Okay, so try and check it out. Um, I just told you this. It's, it's not yet a part of the Linux kernel, but one day it will become. So guys, how do we convert Linux to an RTOS? You need to go to the tree and you, you, you need to get a version of mainline and the corresponding version of the RTL patches and apply them. Now, not every mainline release, vanilla release, is supported by RTL because there are just too many of them. So see folks, um, this is where we get, you know, pub Linux kernel projects RT, real time. This is where the patches are. Now, uh, look at it. Uh, as of now, it's being maintained from 2622, and, and that's literally a decade back or close to it. And as of today, as I'm giving this presentation, the latest LTS kernel is 6.1. So let's look at it. For 6.1, you see, there are there are lots of 6.1 kernels, but they have picked up the 6.1.19 kernel and have modified it to be real time. All you need to download is this single patch, which is of course zipped up. You download it, you uncompress it, you apply it. Apply it on what? 6.1.19, no other kernel. It'll fail to apply, okay? Apply it on that. Do the make menu config. Okay, let me show you. I, I'm sure I have the screenshots. Okay. I've already told you this stuff. So you can go here. You can download this. You can unzip it. You can apply it. You know, the, the usual stuff, guys. Patch minus P1, less than dot dot slash. The usual syntax. Okay. So um, why isn't it a part of mainline? So I was talking about these things. It's quite invasive, but we're hoping it will get into mainline, okay, at some point. Uh, folks, what if I do have an RTL kernel? Um, can I figure that out in the code? Yes, of course you can. There are multiple ways. One is the if def. One is the if is enabled config preempt RT. That's the config directive. Okay. Um, you know, the kernel programming book that I wrote, you'll find a full example of downloading and applying the patch, reconfiguring, rebuilding the kernel for a real machine, the popular Raspberry Pi. And I even do some benchmarking. So 
I leave it to you to check out. Um, okay, guys, I'm sorry. I haven't shown the make menu config screenshot in this presentation. Looks like I missed that. Uh, but if you do it, um, you go under, if I'm not mistaken, kernel features. And there you will find a menu called preemption. And instead of three options, you'll find a fourth option. And the fourth option will be for the preemptible kernel. In other words, RTL, you turn it on, you save and exit, you build the kernel, you deploy it on your target, and you are now running an RTOS. Now, fantastic, amazing. In, imagine we do all of this. Does it help? So uh, let's just look at some benchmarks. Now, it is, it is an old benchmark, but nevertheless, look at this, guys. Uh, Benno ran this benchmark audio sampling under load years ago on a 2.6 vanilla kernel. So see, folks, this is the latency, the y-axis. So um, you see, this is five milliseconds. So this is like most of them are just over a millisecond. No, sorry. Most of them are much under a millisecond. And the red line is where the human here detects dropouts, okay? It's well below that, like even the outliers. Even the outliers are well below the red line, which means what? Which means that even vanilla Linux is definitely soft real-time capable. I mean, this is great. There is jitter. I mean, look at the variance, right? There is a lot of jitter, and in fact, especially here, but it's not too bad considering this isn't an RTOS. It's a GPOS. So, I mean, we can certainly live with that. Okay, now see, he, he runs the same benchmark, but with a 2.6 preemptable kernel, meaning config preempt, applying the patch, configuring the kernel, building and deploying it, and then running the benchmark. And check this out. <laughs> wow. Guys, do you see the red line is here and we are nowhere near it. And just look, there's virtually no jitter or it's very tiny. And that's 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 pretty awesome. Uh, I hope this light is okay. Yeah. So this is this is great. It it really does make a difference. So I, I did another thing, guys. There's another utility called cyclic test. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Thomas Glixner wrote this. And um, I demoed this in my book. I run the Raspberry Pi under load with three different kernels. And I run the cyclic test benchmark in parallel. And I plot the results. So here is a screenshot of the results from my kernel programming book. So here it's running under the real-time kernel. It happened to be 5.4. Here it's running under a standard vanilla 5.4 and over here with the Ubuntu 5.4. And guys, this is the latency experienced via the cyclic test benchmark. benchmark. Minimum average max. So this is very revealing. Look at it. The max latency for the real-time kernel is very low compared to the other kernels. And that is the benefit. Okay. Now, this perhaps makes you say, amazing. I'm, I'm only going to use this. But guys, be careful. It's not only about latency. See, though the latency is like really minimal compared to these, look at the minimum and the average. It's actually a lot better than what um, the real-time kernel gives us. See, over here, the average is 26 microseconds. Here it's 16, here it's 3.8. So what we, you know, kind of infer from this is that not all use cases are good for real-time. In fact, the reality is it's very few guys. Fine, you're flying a drone, you probably need a real-time kernel. But if not, if you're not really doing real-time, if you don't really need real-time, don't use it. 
Okay. In fact, throughput tends to decrease. So it's kind of non-intuitive, but that's how it is. Do a lot of testing. So folks, um, one more thing to say, it's not enough to merely be running an RTOS kernel like RTL. If your intention is to build a real-time system, even the applications you run, the processes and the threads, they have to conform to real-time guidelines. These are some of the real-time guidelines that I'm aware of. Uh, there are probably many more. Keep all these in mind. Okay, otherwise they cause latencies and that could make it unacceptable. In fact, a related topic is threaded interrupts and you should look that up. Guys, these are articles on the older wiki site. So I don't know if all these links are still okay. Uh, as I say here, your mileage may vary. Try it out. Okay. And is anyone using RTL? Yes, of course. Um, this is the OSA development labs. They use it for network testing. This is a big network rack that is running RTL. Uh, drones are already using it. And in, in many products as well, you, you do find RTL. I, I have some customers who have begun to use it. So folks, uh, we're almost done. Why is this smiley over here? I'll show you. Hang on a sec. There's always more to learn. And I mean, we're all learning all the time, guys. So I'm just encouraging you to learn more about these things. There are so much. There is so much to learn. There are so many tools on Linux. Nothing is hidden on Linux. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of effort looking into things. So folks, there's a lot to learn. How do you learn all this? <laughs> Read my books. That's why the smiling. Okay, guys, um, thank you so much. I am uh, I regret that I could not personally be at the conference and take questions. I would have loved to do that another time. I'm hoping this will happen with the next LF conference that I'll be there in person. But um, if you'd like, please email me. I'm giving you my mail address. Um, raise issues on the GitHub site. Um, talk to me. I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Hope you enjoyed this presentation, guys. Take care. All the best.